All right, welcome back everybody. Um, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Um, Scott Nielsen um, of Pesticide Management Compliance uh, Program is going to share with us the proposed changes to the um, pesticide penalty rules and the penalty matrix. So, all right, Scott. Thank you, Savannah. Um, unless I hear otherwise, I'm just going to uh, proceed ahead that uh, you guys can hear me. And I'll have you run slides again, Savannah. That worked uh, fine. So um, thank you, everybody, for uh, you know joining this uh, last part of our presentation today, where I'll be discussing our penalty matrix uh, for pesticide misuse violations. I appreciate all of you uh, tuning in today. Again, as a reminder, I'm Scott Nielsen. I'm new to the uh, program manager position. Been doing it for about five weeks, but I come to it as the uh, a case review officer uh, for the pesticide uh, management division. So uh, my contact information does appear on this slide. I, I missed it on the first one, so there's how to get a hold of me for those of you that don't already know it. Okay, go ahead and run to the next slide. I'm actually going to turn my camera off just because I have some reading to do while I'm doing this one. So you don't have to see my head nodding up and down the whole time. You've already seen my mug, so I'll turn it back on toward the end. So I know a lot of you have been participating in this since we really started it, uh, gosh, two years ago in terms of our original CR 101 to amend our penalty matrix. So this will be review for some of you, but I do see a lot of new names uh, in the list there. So I want to make sure everybody's up to speed on what we're talking about here. So we certainly in the uh, compliance division have, have two laws that we operate under, RCW 1558 and uh, 1721, the Pesticide Control Act and the Pesticide Application Act. And those basically state that uh, in statute that uh, we can issue a $7,500 civil penalty for any person who fails to comply with uh, the chapters. Um, and it's per every such violation uh, that occurs. The rulemaking that we're going to be talking about here this morning doesn't change that. That's still that's in statute that would require legislative change. So we're not doing that. We're just looking at uh, a rule change here. Realize too the department has all sorts of several other rules, including our general pesticide rules, uh, where this where our penalty matrix is found, worker protection standard rules, chemigation, bulk pesticide storage rules, and even like our specific county rule restrictions for Eastern Washington to protect sensitive crops. So, if a person violates any of the pesticide laws or rules, they could be subject to civil penalties and license suspension. I do want to state that while we're going to be talking about penalties for violations, the department very much favors voluntary compliance. We do believe that compliance is best achieved by education and training, and that's why our staff put so much effort into farm worker and handler training, pesticide recertification courses, and technical assistance outreach in the field. Next slide, please. So this is our current penalty matrix that's in our uh, general rules. And this is what we're going to be discussing today is, is modifying this and changing it. And we, we're going to talk a little bit about how we calculate the penalties for violations uh, once we've conducted an inspection or, or, or a, a case investigation and what would be the appropriate penalty and, and license suspension that uh, maybe an applicator would get. Realize this has to be commensurate with the seriousness of the violation. In other words, major violations with harmful effects get larger penalties than minor violations with little effect. They must be fair and uniform. We must treat everyone the same. And they cannot be arbitrary or biased. Next one, please. So here's some of the issues that we've looked at. Um, the current penalty matrix in the general rules is sort of a one size fits all. It has the uh, you know maximum civil penalty in there at uh, 7,500, um, but it, it's just the one single matrix. And we have so many different types of potential uh, violations that we deal with, a record keeping, licensing, off target drift, maybe crop damage or human exposure. And we have the worker protection standard. We have lots of different types of rules that we're out there enforcing and this one uh, penalty matrix at times uh, doesn't always work for us. Uh, we, 
everything you're going to hear from me today is sort of based upon input from uh, myself and past case review officers and program managers going back through uh, uh, Tim Schultz and Joel Kangeser and Cliff Weed in terms of um, effectively uh, implementing our, our Pendley matrix. This was first adopted into rule in 1999, and then it was revised in January 2001. So it's been in effect for over 20 years since it was updated. Um, one thing we've, we've looked at from that, what I'd shown you, and I'll bring it up again later, is we need to reduce the levels of violation from four levels down to three. The fourth level is, is rarely reached. Uh, I think only once in the 20 tiers have we ever even gotten there. And so it, uh, it's really not, uh, doesn't add much utility there. And most violations we'll discuss later are at the first level in the matrix. One thing we need to do, and this will address, we need to better define how penalties are to be increased or you know, aggravated for aggravating factors or decreased if we look at mitigating factors from a level calculated in the penalty. Next slide, please. Some of the things we looked at that need to be changed, we need to more clearly allow an increased civil penalty against companies, farms, individuals, and proportionally reduce the license suspension days when an action against the license is ineffective. In a lot of situations, like a private applicator license, uh, suspension really is not much of an initial deterrent. A farm may have multiple employees with a license, or they might apply products that aren't restricted use pesticides. So the, the license suspension really doesn't have, uh, maybe isn't much of a deterrent there. Um, we also have unlicensed employees of apartment complexes, housing agencies, et cetera, who sometimes make improper uh, indoor outdoor applications that could result in human exposure. Again, they're not licensed, maybe don't need to be anyway. And so the license suspension uh, currently isn't much of a deterrent. For WPS violations, there's really no licensing requirement to be an ag employer. And that's typically who's being cited for certain WPS violations. So again, the license suspension portion, I'll address this a bit later too, is really not applicable. And uh, so we tend to proportionately adjust the civil penalty at this time, and that can be a bit confusing uh, for the recipient of the penalty. Uh, and sometimes we have unlicensed homeowners, property owners that could be cited for pesticide violations that result in a civil penalty too. Next slide, please. Something I need to make sure everybody's clear on here, because again, we've got all different levels of part, people participating. Um, there's only certain situations where we're going to be dealing with this penalty matrix. Uh, very uh, rare situations where we do have uh, a danger, of, you know, someone is placed in uh, endangered or or we have property damage greater than a thousand dollars so there's only certain situations uh, by statute um, we need to issue a notice of correction first time we find violations at a place uh, we typically issue a notice of correction uh, giving the uh, business or the person an opportunity to make corrections um, but here are the situations listed where we could go to the penalty matrix, where we could be issuing a civil penalty or a license suspension. Um, the person has previously received a notice of correction for the same or similar violation. Uh, they failed to make corrections by the required date on a, a previously received notice of correction. Uh, maybe we'd given someone a month or two to come into compliance for something and they still didn't do it. Um, or, and these are the primary ones that come into play a lot. The violation has a probability of placing a person in uh, danger of death or bodily harm, uh, causing more than a minor environmental harm, uh, causing physical damage exceeding $1,000. So you could see like in a landscape situation, it sometimes could take quite a bit to get to a $1,000 damage. But in an agricultural setting, uh, it could be sometimes a, a fairly small amount of uh, acreage or property could easily exceed $1,000 in damage through some sort of a, a misapplication. Uh, the final one here is the violation was committed by a business that employed 50 or more employees on at least one day in each of the preceding months. So it's based on, or 12 months. So that's basically based on the size of larger companies or corporations. And I, we really have not utilized of that one uh, that I'm aware of. Next. So just a bit of history to kind of give you some background again of, of what we're talking about there. I went back and we looked at a five year period, uh, 2016 through 2020. And in that period, we did 1,728 uh, case investigations and uh, uh, routine inspections. And 
of those, about 50%, uh, we took no formal action um, or maybe just a, a verbal warning of a, of a minor violation or an advisory letter of something that needed to be improved. So about 50%, 45% uh, um, received a notice of correction. So there was a notice of correction issued uh, as a result of one of those. And sometimes two NOCs might uh, be sent out on the same uh, inspection or case. If maybe there were two different people involved or uh, uh, two, two different um, notes of corrections uh, needing to be issued. Um, but the big one here I wanted to show is that notice of intent column. Uh, and you can see that over that time frame, we issued 80 notice of intent for civil action, civil penalties, and that's about 5%. A total of dollar values assessed over that time was 75,850. Um, but it really ranged of, of a low one year of about 8,000 to a high one year of, I think, 29,000. So really just depending on the size or severity of, of the cases or, or inspection violations involved. Next. Another thing before I get into the new matrix is just to make sure the group is, is well aware that we deal with all kinds of um, investigations. A lot of you on might be involved in a, a specific uh, uh, agricultural area. A lot of you might be involved in a PCO industry. Some of you may just be concerned overall or have environmental concerns. And I know we've got just a wide range of, of, of people that are on. And so I just threw in a couple of examples of the different types of cases that I know I've been involved in just the last couple of years for penalties. Um, and, and certainly like upper left would be a, a, a classic case of uh, like lime sulfur impacting a, a person. You can see the person in the lower right a portion of that uh, picture. And there was about a dozen more workers just out of sight uh, behind the trees there to the right. Uh, and if that video was continuing to run, you'd see that lime sulfur moving clear over a couple hundred feet uh, to the right. Uh, mothballs, probably one of the more commonly uh, used pesticides in, in, in the United States as a whole, but also probably the most commonly misused pesticide. Uh, nobody hardly reads the label and realizes that mothballs need to be used in an uh, airtight, uh, sealed tight container or a sealable closet. And it's really only to control moths, I think in wool clothing. So really pretty specific. But people use mothballs for all sorts of deterrents, or they misapply them in areas where it can cause, uh, you know, naphthalene to be a, a present in a in a Airbnb or a rental place or something, and, and people could sometimes be made ill. Uh, lower left is just an example. That's actually the cloud you see there is phosphine gas emanating for some garbage um, from some uh, FEMA toxin tablets that were actually um, uh, miss. Um, uh, thrown away. So they were not properly disposed of and they were still active. They had not been spent. And of course, they mingled with the grass clippings and, and moisture in the garbage and caught a garbage truck on fire. And uh, as the fire department came and put more water on it, of course, they reacted to it and just put off more phosphine gas. So quite a serious situation where we had nine people that had worked at the transfer station and or were first responders uh, had to spend a couple days in a hospital. Uh, the lower right, of course, is a fogger type canister for insect control, and we do end up with a lot of complaint investigations involving uh, human illness regarding those when they're misapplied. Uh, uh, people commonly don't properly mark the door as per the label instructions, and people might enter a, a place where uh, everything's been sealed up and uh, the, uh, several bug bombs have just put them, been put off. So, and again, a lot of times that one involves maybe some unlicensed people. Just some examples, wide range of things that can end up in uh, civil penalties. Next, please. So, one more thing, I'm just going to make sure everybody understands where we need to sort of uh, accept the premise, uh, everybody that's listening today, that as we move forward with a penalty, when we issue a notice of intent for a civil penalty that the department has uh, sufficient information, uh, we've gathered appropriate evidence to move forward. We're not going to be moving forward with a penalty if, if we don't have enough evidence. So uh, a lot of times I know those of you on may have history with us or something else where you felt that, gee, you know, maybe we took an action here and it wasn't done right or something. But but we are not going to move forward unless our field staff, uh, they've gone out there and done 
what they do well, with, and which is you know gather the right evidence through through uh, uh, photographs, uh, interviews, statements, uh, sampling that we do, all uh, weather readings, all the other types of uh, evidence that our field staff will gather um, before we move forward with a nose of intent. These are all civil type cases. Our burden of proof is a preponderance of evidence is what we need. So more than 50%. So more likely than not, this is what occurred. We can demonstrate what occurred. Uh, you know, and what would a reasonable person uh, weighing the evidence uh, come to the conclusion of the determination of uh, that a violation did occur as described in the notice of intent. Uh, again, of course, this won't change. This is in statute and it's not changing. When we issue a notice of intent, the entire administrative proceedings process uh, will not be affected. A person uh, receiving a notice of intent still has uh, 25 days to respond back to us, uh, request a hearing or, or, in, or, or in some other way contest or, or negotiate the, um, the penalty. So that will not change. That's in statute. OK, next. So again, this is our existing penalty matrix that we have in rule. We've been dealing with this one since 1999. Um, one of the things that's in current statute you can see is we've got this minimum, median, and maximum range within each side. We're mostly going to focus on the right side of things. This is the adverse effects probable side. Um, and this is the side we deal with when we have human exposure, crop damage, environmental harm, things like that, those types of cases. On the left side is adverse effects not probable. That's where we would be dealing with things like licensing violations or uh, improperly licensed um, uh, places doing distribution, improper record keeping, those types of things. So um, going back over to the right hand side, the reason I have these highlighted is in our current rule, it says unless we have mitigating or aggravating factors, we are to assess a penalty at this median level. So you can see the median level where we do most of our uh, penalty assessments for a first level offense is $450 and a seven day license suspension. And again, that seven day license suspension is sort of if applicable. Uh, one of the things currently in statute is we can adjust proportionally adjust the penalty up and reduce the days down when appropriate. So we sometimes do do that when a licensing um, suspension is not applicable or the person isn't even licensed. The reason I've got these highlighted is um, of those 80 notices of intent that we'd issued in that five year period, 76 of them fell in the first range, uh, the first offense, and only four of them fell into the second range. And at this time, we didn't have any that fell into the third or fourth or more range. And you can see that the vast number then are falling at that at first level. A couple are going to the to the second level. The second level is reached, uh, and this won't change in our current uh, proposed language, uh, when the same same or similar offense occurs within a three year period. So if a person is penalized at that first level, and then the same offense, or they 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 happen to violate the same offense again within a three year period, they would get assessed at the second level. And if it would happen again within a third year period, they would get assessed at that third level. Um, so again, we, as far as I know, have not gotten to the fourth level and have rarely gotten to the third level. Next slide, please. So here's what we're proposing. Separate, uh, Types, certain types of violations, we're thinking of separating them out. So uh, just a flat violation we'll look at or a penalty for certain record keeping errors, minor record keeping errors, um, a, a different penalty matrix for uh, operating improperly licensed or without a license, um, a, another matrix penalty for uh, violations of the worker protection standard. We're looking at a base penalty for all the other types of, of incidents that occur, such as uh, basically uh, the human exposure type issues or crop damage or environmental harm type things. We're looking at a base penalty for that. One of the things here, we're looking at taking that fourth level out completely, just going to three levels uh, to make the entire uh, matrix just more, have more utility to it. Um, so next slide, we'll show some of this. We'll get looking at each of these. So 
for record keeping errors. And this is very common with all of our inspections, a lot of our case investigations, we're always asking for records. Uh, many of you on here have probably received a record request from us where we formally ask for records of an application that might've been made the day before, might've been made a week before, might've been made three weeks before, or we might be looking at a whole year's worth of records if it's a, um, a dealer inspection or a record keeping inspection for a, a distribution place. And so uh, we get we find record keeping errors. We've got all kinds of things that need to be required to be kept. And if they're not done right, we find errors. So we're looking at a, a just a simple $250 flat uh, fine for record keeping errors. Keep in mind, um, this wouldn't be for a first offense, because if a person has a uh, record keeping errors the first time they will get warned so this is they've already received a notice of correction for this and so they've got a notice of correction for bad records and then maybe a year or two later uh, they repeat the same offense and uh, so we would go to this $250 fine okay next here we're looking at a matrix that we've set up for operating without a license okay and like I said, this is sort of on the adverse effects, not probable side of the current matrix, but we're looking at just creating a, a, its own matrix uh, because it's a serious thing. Uh, if we look at the left-hand column there, uh, a lot of people that are uh, properly trained, properly licensed, Christina gave a whole big update on uh, licensing requirements and um, uh, recertification requirements. And uh, we require insurance, uh, you know, minimums, all sorts of different things. And so we've got people properly licensed, properly trained, doing a good job out there. And then we sometimes catch people that are not licensed. We find people out there operating in the PCO industry, the landscape industry, the ag industry, other industries that need to be licensed that aren't. And so we're looking at considerably steep penalties for that. We're looking at $2,500 for a first offense for operating uh, as a commercial applicator not being properly licensed. Currently, that would be in the range of about a $600 penalty. So we're looking at uh, $2,500. You can see for second level offense, it basically doubles. We're going up $2,500. Uh, if, if a person were to ignore it and we catch them again, it'd go to 5,000. And you can see here, we're taking out the days of suspension because currently the days of suspension is completely not applicable uh, it, because they're not licensed anyway. <laughs> and so uh, we're taking that out. Another thing I wanna remind the group about, that looks really steep there going from 600 to $2,500, but realize again, this uh, person or business has been warned. They've, the first time we catch them, uh, there's no harm, no endangerment, no thousand dollars of damage. And so we need by statute to send them a notice of correction. So we catch an unlicensed company, we send them a notice of correction. This first penalty you're seeing here where we would go civil action means we've caught them a second time. We've got sufficient evidence that they're still operating a second time. Now we can go uh, to the penalty. The middle column there is a is somebody operating as a pesticide dealer distributing restricted use pesticides and they're not properly licensed. Currently, that would probably be again about a $600 penalty for a first time offense. We're looking at a, at a flat $1,000 penalty for that. So that'd be a somebody improperly distributing our uh, restricted use pesticides without a license. The right hand column would be um, all other uh, violations operating improperly licensed. So that might deal more with, say, a commercial operator working underneath uh, the authority of, uh, of an applicator, uh, maybe improperly or improperly licensed. Uh, it certainly could deal with other types of uh, pesticide distribution businesses that aren't dealing with RUPs. A lot of farm supply stores or things like that that are selling general use products need to be properly licensed, need to be keeping proper records, and they're not licensed. Again, all of these would have been warned with some sort of a notice of correction in advance before we go to these penalties. Next. Here we're looking at another penalty matrix that we're looking at putting into the rule specific to violations of the worker protection standards. The worker protection standards, again, are kind of unique because when we're out doing inspections, if we find violations at a at a primarily usually, you know, farm, forest, nursery or greenhouse is where these are applicable. Um, it, it's usually the agricultural employer 
that is responsible to make sure that all the things for handlers, all the training, equipment, supplies, decon, everything for handlers, everything for workers, they're responsible to make sure that that's all being done. If we cite that uh, ag employer for not doing it right, realize again, there's no license requirement to be an ag employer. There's no, you don't have to be licensed. So currently in our, in our matrix, that seven day license suspension is sort of meaningless. So currently today, when we start a farm for significant um, uh, WPS violations that could endanger or potentially harm uh, primarily handlers, where we, where we look at a first offense, uh, today it's usually a $900 penalty. For a, for a single violation of uh, decontamination supplies or a single violation of not providing uh, proper PPE supplies because it's the $450 seven days. We proportionally adjust that $450 to 900 and so and, and drop the days. And so it's currently a $900 penalty. We're looking at just a $1,000 flat penalty for the first offense. So really this is only about a 10% increase over what we're doing currently. but. But we're looking at a thousand dollar penalty for first level offense for those uh, types of violations. And you can see it doubles if we were to find it again within three years and, and based triples if uh, if we were to find it again. Again, this is uh, the WPS is also a little bit unique in that, again, we normally issue a notice of correction to the farm or the or the ag employer for or greenhouse, whatever the situation is for the violations that we find. Um, most of the violations that would involve training, uh, proper posting, proper notification, uh, proper uh, uh, equipment for workers and things like that, Th those types of things, we would send them a notice of correction first and give them an opportunity to fix it. Where we have our first, uh, sometimes we do issue penalties first time again, if it's significant decontamination supply violations or PPE uh, violations for handlers because they're the ones directly working with pesticides and, and there's a potential there for harm. So we do have that endangerment harm aspect. So we could go right to this first level of offense. Over on the right hand side is when they're in violation of, of those other things I mentioned and maybe they've already received a notice of correction. So they've already received an NOC for improper training improper posting, improper, some other aspect of the WPS, as you all know, it gets pretty involved. Uh, but if we got repeat violations, say a second year on a follow-up inspection, that's where the $500 uh, a starting penalty would be for that first offense, okay? So we're looking at a splitting out WPS to have its own matrix. Next slide, please. This is the, the biggest one where we're looking at really a, some big changes. And this is the base penalty concept that we're looking at for like uh, drift situations that could cause human exposure issues, uh, adverse effect probable, which you could look at that as, as crop damage or maybe environmental harm where it's going into a, a you know, improperly to a, a lake or a pond or a, a riparian area or something, or some other uh, ground contamination issue, something like that. Um, but uh, and then uh, adverse effects not probable would be on the right hand side. And so I'm going to start with the human exposure one first. I showed you our existing penalty matrix was $450 and seven days. We're looking at a first level offense of $1,500. Uh, and this is where I've, I've implemented a change after going out and um, visiting with lots of different stakeholder groups in the last year. We're looking at a five day license suspension, okay? Currently, it's seven days. Uh, some of the initial stuff that we put out and discussed uh, in the last year was at six days. We're looking at a five-day uh, license suspension. Uh, so we're looking at a, a significant increase in the civil penalty to $1,500, but reducing the days of license suspension. And you can see for a second level offense, if again, the person had the same incident occur or something similar occurred, uh, uh, putting uh, human exposure at risk or endangerment, uh, it, it basically doubles. We go to 3,000 in 10 days. If it happened again, it'd be a $6,000 penalty in, in, in 20 days. What we're going to address a little bit later under that column and, and the other column is what we're looking at too is better language to work on aggravating or mitigating circumstances. When would that $1,500 
be raised or lowered in the five days, depending on other uh, things, factors that could be involved in, in the incident that occurred. Because you can imagine from those types of things that I showed you, there's lots of different things and lots of uh, different factors that can take place with all these uh, types of things. The middle one is adverse effects probable, like I said. Think of something like where somebody has a, a drift case, if you will, that creates significant crop damage. Um, and uh, we would cite that person for a first offense for a base penalty of $1,000. That's basically about a doubling of the current uh, penalty matrix. Okay, If you look at um, just the increase in inflation alone since 1999, it almost warrants a doubling. It's at about 180% from 1999 to current. And so uh, that one's basically just looking at double, just almost just keeping up with inflation. Part of why we're looking at reducing the days too is also sort of taking into account inflation and in that a, a one day uh, license suspension also uh, costs more to a business than it did back in 1999 too. So that's a, a more significant penalty than it was back in 1999. The adverse effects not probable on the right hand side, I'm trying to think of what cases that might be. And that might get back to something like record keeping where we asked for records and uh, somebody refused to provide them. Maybe we didn't get records or we didn't get them in time. That would go under the uh, adverse effects not probable. You could have, there's probably some other situations I could think of where it'd be there too under that column. Um, next slide, please. So just going to run through some quick examples of how that might be implemented in a, in a case or a situation and showing how they might get aggravated or mitigated if, um, if applicable. So if we have pesticide drift with one person that was exposed, or some other misapplication. Drift is just one example. Uh, you could use the uh, bug bomb example that I showed too. Um, but let's say we had pesticide misapplication with one person exposed, no confirmed symptoms of illness, uh, you know, maybe just uh, watery eyes or, or some other effect, and it's a first time violation. So we, what we, under our old matrix, that would be a penalty of $450 and a seven day suspension. What we're proposing with this new language is it would be a penalty of $1,500 civil penalty and a five-day license suspension if applicable, okay, for the person. So there's really no aggravating or mitigating factors to consider in this one. Run to my next scenario, if you would. Here we're looking at, again, same scenario, one person exposed, but now the person had some definite confirmed uh, signs of illness. Yeah, maybe we had a rash, maybe we had, uh, could be vomiting or uh, some other nausea, some other illness, but something that's, that's measurable that, that could be noted. Still a first time violation. In this scenario, um, we would look at it exactly the same as the last one, but we have an aggravating factor here. And what we're putting into rule is that we can aggravate that base penalty up or down by a factor of 25% uh, of that penalty. Uh, for each aggravating factor or mitigating factor that could be involved. So here we have an aggravating factor that it was severe enough to, to have an illness. And so under the existing rules, again, we would probably uh, maximize that one or, you know, remember that column had a minimum, a median and a maximum. The maximum under our existing rules would be $550 and a nine day license suspension. What we're looking at implementing here would be 25% increase over that 1500 would be $375 added. So it's basically an 1875 penalty and a six day license suspension. I'm gonna reiterate here that these license suspensions are really mostly, is a really big deterrent and mostly just affect um, commercial applicators. Whereas a six day suspension, uh, certainly puts an operator out of business for six days or puts an applicator potentially puts a business out of uh, 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 out of business for six days. So you can imagine, again, that's a much more significant uh, economic factor uh, potentially than even in the eighteen hundred and seventy five dollars. And um, but it's not the six days is not that big of a factor, maybe certainly as we mentioned for a private applicator. Where they're not even a, they don't need their license if they're not applying restricted use pesticides um, or a private commercial type license or even a public operator 
where maybe there's um, there's two people in the in the cab of a of a DOT uh, truck. Uh, the other one could be licensed. So there's usually there's other public operators maybe that can take that. So it's mostly we recognize a, a big significant deterrent for commercial applicators. Next slide, please. Here I'm going to look at a more severe situation and every couple of years we do get some fairly severe situations. I, I showed the one with the fumatoxin or the uh, the lime sulfur application that affected maybe a maybe a dozen. Um, so here we have an example. I'm going to say drift with five people exposed and all five had confirmed signs or symptoms of illness that we could confirm. Uh, who required medical treatment, maybe maybe a, a trip to a hospital, and it's a first time violation. OK, so we're still looking at that first level. So each aggravating factor, remember, is 25 percent of the base penalty. So that'd be three hundred seventy five dollars and a day and a quarter day suspension potentially added to that base factor. So what we're looking at here is just sort of a worksheet for this type of a scenario which we haven't had in the past. So in addition to the one person, that accounts for the first $1,500 uh, five-day base penalty. But now we have four additional people that were exposed. So we have four aggravating factors. We have five that all uh, were made ill by whatever it was. And so, and two that required medical attention. We basically just add those up as a total of 11 aggravating factors. So you would have 11 times $375 and a, and a one and a quarter day suspension would be $4,125 and a 14 day suspension added to that base penalty. I went back and looked under our existing rules, a penalty of, of, of this nature would maybe come out about in the realm of a, a $2,750 penalty and a 45 day license suspension. Under the proposed rule, this penalty would come out at about $5,625 and a 19 day uh, license suspension. So this example sort of shows our intent of increasing the civil penalties over, over what we're doing now and decreasing the reliance on uh, license suspensions. Uh, one thing I do want to mention here, because it was brought up a long time ago, we want to make sure that when we talk about medical treatment, it's that the person had to go to the clinic because of, of the effects that they had of being sprayed. In no way do we want to um, discourage anybody from ever going to see, uh, send, send people to a clinic. You know, if just out of due caution, we we're just working on a case uh, a month or two ago where uh, a, a person was sent to a clinic just out of due caution uh, because of a potential alleged exposure uh, to make sure that they were okay. And so in that case scenario where maybe it, uh, they did go to a clinic, but there was really nothing to evaluate there, no, no effects, we wouldn't be using that as a, an aggravating factor. It, we, we would have, we're going to be evaluating closely that when we say required medical treatment, it really was as a result of, of the exposure there. Next one, please. Some things that are in current rule that we're not going to change, and, and we, we've left this language in there for, for uh, just usability and flexibility. Uh, one of the things we're leaving in there is still the ability to increase the civil penalty and reduce the license suspension when it's appropriate for, for a given situation or the person or business that's involved. We still have that flexibility in there um, or vice versa to decrease the civil penalty and increase the licensing suspension. But for whatever reason, that be appropriate. Um, I, as I already mentioned, we're going to have lots of different aggravating factors and mitigating factors. Instead of going into all those, I'll just tell you that they are described in the proposed rule. Aggravating factor might be something like multiple pesticides involved in a, in a tank mix. It might involve um, uh, the toxicity, certainly, of the products, certainly a skull and gro a crossbone product, a poison, a uh, danger poison, or a, 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 a warning label type product or a danger, excuse me, type product are going to be at, a, at aggravated a higher level. 
uh, a mitigating factor again might be the lack of a signal word on a on a product. It's deemed relatively safe, a 25B pesticide or something, uh, or there are. Uh, even uh, regular EPA Section 3 labels that sometimes don't even have a warning label now uh, because of their, you know, basically non-toxicity. But certainly a caution label, which is the vast majority of the labels uh, out there, might be a, a mitigating factor. So there's lots of different things we would look at as aggravating or mitigating factors uh, involved in, a, in one of these cases. Another thing that's in current rule and, and is in law that will stay in there is that remember, each and every violation of our chapters or a rule that a, a person is in violation of could be cited. So we could do specific violations for uh, a penalty for whatever they're in violation of. And uh, so the total for a notice of intent could exceed $7,500 because the limit is $7,500 per violation, not per incident. And so it's it's possible that we could have a severe enough case where there is a, an $8,000 penalty or a $10,000 penalty uh, issued uh, for different penalties or more for violations. Um, and we just would have to just clearly describe that and define it in our notice of intent. Uh, and the department may at its discretion deviate from the penalty calculation rules adopted in this chapter uh, when uh, necessary. Uh, I can't think of a situation where, uh, but again, we're always going to be limited limited by the 7500 in statute. But this that's language that's in current rule, and uh, a lot of the current language is, is just going to stay in there in the rule. The others, like I said, we're just improving to make it uh, give it more utility and make it more defensible for us and uh, create what I was saying, almost sort of a worksheet for the more complex type things that sometimes come up, especially those that involve uh, multiple people. Uh, next one, please. So in the effort of staying on time, which I think I did pretty good, uh, certainly all of you uh, uh, have my contact information. Call. I encourage you to call if you've got questions or comments and any part of this that we're talking about for our proposed rule. Um, later, I'll certainly attach. We'll figure out a way to attach the proposed language so that all of you can actually see it. Um, but I'm going to say it's not an easy read. Uh, you know, it's got track changes through the whole thing, showing the changes from the current rule and language. And because I'm modifying from one penalty matrix to uh, three, it's like completely rearranging things. So there's like some whole pages that are like lined out with new pages suggested. There were uh, uh, new chapter numbers and things like that. So it's not an easy read, but I certainly want to get it out there for anybody to look at. Email me with any comments or um, ideas that you might have. Um, like I said, we'll try to, I'll try to, I, I know I've got to clean up some of my um, narrative that goes along with this, but we'll post this presentation uh, like in a PDF format too, so that uh, people can see that or figure out a way to share it. Um, uh, unless there's questions or comments, I will add that we're looking to hopefully maybe get the CR, we've released the CR 101 uh, uh, two years ago on this. We released another CR 101 on this in September, just because so much time had gone past. We will be issuing a CR uh, 102. We're hoping by uh, late this very fall, to try to get that CR 102 out so we can maybe have our public hearing uh, process uh, prior to uh, getting into the legislative season. So we don't want to interrupt or uh, interfere with anything that could be going on with anybody uh, during the legislative season. So um, we, we'd like to maybe uh, proceed with this and get it in there. So uh, thank you everybody for your time and patience. I know that was a lot, a ton of material. Again, there's my, uh, my final slide. And I don't know, uh, I will leave it up to anybody moderating if there's hands up or anything. It's always hard for me to see the whole list of, of, of people there. So um, happy to try to address anything. Uh, this way I'd have, or certainly I know some of you could call me um, off offline too. Happy to visit with anybody. Great, yeah, so we'll open it up to questions for Scott or really anyone that presented today. Um, you can raise your hand, type in the chat, or uh, do, I think, star five for um, people who are calling in. 
I'll go back to my camera since I, so I don't get chastised by Robin. Savannah, I don't see anything in the chat at this time. I don't know if, uh, how long you want to give the, uh, folks to enter a question. Or raise your hand. I know many hand. of these people online have yeah. already uh, talked to me in the last year. <laughs> we, okay. we can wait a minute or so and, yeah. and make sure people have time. I know I just admitted someone back in and give people time to raise their hands or ask a question. This is Robin. But it also looks like a number of people are sliding off very efficiently. That's all right. <laughs> Numbers have dropped.